Poroj Banerjee, um, who's a lecturer and joint program leader, development and planning and administration uh, and development planning unit of uh, the University College in London. Uh, Ratula Kundu, who's an assistant professor of Center for Policy and Governance in uh, TIS, Mumbai, and Maggie Paul, who is a PhD scholar in University of Adelaide, uh, Australia. Um, the talk will focus on the way home, uh, house, houseless communities were affected by the COVID lockdown, uh, as is obvious from the topic, but it is drawing from ongoing research in Mumbai, Kolkata, and Delhi, and the way uh, communities faced those issues in from 20 to 21. Um, we, the three speakers are interestingly part of the uh, project called Hamari Pehjan, a collective of act activists and acad uh, acad ac academics who are uh, collaborating on, talk, on inclusive cities and governance and uh, urban transformations. Uh, so welcome them. We, I welcome them to talk more about their work uh, from here on. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Aprajita. And thanks a lot to my colleagues at CPR India and Center the Science at Humane's uh, for inviting us to this talk. And thanks a lot to everyone who has joined us in the audience. Um, a few of us, you were just talking about Hamari Pechan, so just to give you a context. So a few of us, that is the activists, academics, and media professionals and practitioners in the field, uh, in the urban field, felt the need for a space where we could bring activism and scholarship and practice together to read and engage uh, with the systemic adversities around us. And this was felt even more strongly during the pandemic. And hence this uh, collective came into being. And it's called Hamari Pechan, as, as you just uh, you know shared with everyone. And uh, and the first collaboration that we did was a project called Interrogating Unsafety, and the talk today sort of underlines much of that. And, um, and through this, we examined how uh, the governance of the pandemic, which was meant to protect people, created conditions of unsafety, uh, particularly for the unhoused groups in Indian cities. The structure of the talk is such that I'll be laying out a broad context of houselessness in Indian cities, talking a little bit about, you know, what houselessness is, the, term, the terminologies we are using, the politics around the terminologies, and a little bit, or speak a little bit about uh, the broad findings from this uh, project. Uh, and this will be followed by Maggie sharing her insights from Mumbai, and Ratula will be concluding with an overall insight from the project and the broad trends that are emerging in the urban context. So let me start uh, with a provocation by saying that for the urban poor, which is a substantial portion of urban inhabitants, this pandemic was in fact not a health issue. It was an issue of housing injustice, which continued from the pre-pandemic times. It was an issue of hunger, loss of livelihood, uh, the complete erasure of social networks and collective forms of life that enable people to survive in an already harsh environment. So the image that you're seeing, uh, Maggie, if you could just share the slide, and I wanted to sh just show you a few images, um, which was a depiction of the everyday street life in the pre-pandemic times. So this is uh, from the project, but Maggie, if you could go to the next slide, uh, you know, this is an ordinary everyday street life, and which was, as you can see, was harsh, uh, unsettling, discriminatory, yet the ways of inhabiting the city was in enduring. And it was a very strong response to the already existing dominant politics of inclusion within the city. So pandemic, rather the management of the pandemic disrupted all of these means of survival. And we know that the imposition of the lockdown to, scurb, to curb the spread of COVID has been harsh uh, in India, but as much like in you know, many places in, in the world, social distancing administered through control over control over and policing of densities and bodies became a political tool of governing the pandemic. By relegating safety within a designated interior and physical space commonly referred to as the home, the governance of the pandemic in, invoked some of the already uh, existing uh, colonial tropes of planning and administration to segregate and shield the hypervisible urban poor from the house urban gentry. Now, as the idea of safety that was circulated during the pandemic not only reinforced hegemonic ideas of home, but exacerbated this urban dispossession around housing. Our project looked at uh, you know, this issue and uh, very much at the impact of the COVID-19 governance 
uh, particularly the sudden lockdown had on unhoused uh, groups in Indian cities. Uh, and I want to stress a little bit on this term terminology uh, that we are using of unhoused or houseless rather than using homelessness. And simply because, uh, and, 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 this is, and we're using this terminology to understand the impact of the lockdown on urban poor inhabitants who live on streets, open spaces, and what is generally understood as public spaces. This simply because we realize that home is subjective and as researchers and activists, it is our, you know, we might take some sort of a duty to recognize that people have varied practices of feeling and being at home. Now, in dominant planning imaginations, a very market-based physical interior space often get, often is perceived to be safe, um, and as that's a space that gets circulated as home. Now, it is important to distinguish this category of urban inhabitants because often they get left out or invisibilized in the narratives of urban poverty and informal housing that is focused on more living dense conditions, often known as the slums. Now, density was viewed as a challenge in managing the pandemic, uh, even this time around. So much of the planning and control has been around the areas of these areas of concerns, mainly managing dense neighborhoods of slums. The pandemic has very much reinforced these ideas of the urban poor, informal settlements and overall housing in the city. As the home was seen as an important place to shield from the virus, those inhabiting the streets uh, were perceived to be the contaminators and several measures were introduced to confine these groups economically, politically, socially, and you know, in, in many, many other ways and physically, particularly spatially. So I'm going to not, I'm not going to go into the depth of it, but very quickly explain the five broad trends that we notice in our collaboration. And I'm, invite, I'm going to invite Maggie and Ratsala to shed further light on that. But one of the things that sort of happened or continued to happen was this whole issue around perceptions. So the pandemic recirculated some of the dominant and exclusionary perceptions that the LA city had about the urban poor, particularly those who became hyper visible on the streets. With the onset of the lockdown, narratives of outsiderness, that is not belonging to the city, of being dirty, of being unhygienic, of their bodies being un un unhygienic, um, of being carriers of the disease floated around abundantly. Uh, these narratives were so strong that even well-meaning attempts by local governance of government of providing temporary relief, such as rehabilitating unhoused groups in spaces like schools or community centers, met with strong resistance from local residents in many parts of the country. The other thing, second uh, trend that I'm going to talk about is it, it sort of became, it pronounced the boundaries of the inside and the outside. Indian cities, and in fact, much of the cities in the global south is characterized by uh, urban squatting or what is termed as informal uh, ways of living. And this forms the constituted genealogies of many of the urban spaces um, in, in these uh, areas. The inside and the outside that exists as complementary to each other suddenly became these two opposing spheres uh, in the way the pandemic was covered. The insider or the physical structure of the house was seen to be a safe space where one could shield from the virus, while the outside, that is the street, the public space, became a dangerous sphere of picking up and circulating the virus. Now, this thought percolated in the pandemic planning, completely disregarding that for a large group of urban inhabitants, it is the outside which is their homes. Lockdown measures were harsh and weighed heavily on the urban poor. They were not only physically tortured by law enforcing authorities, but also their bodies were kept in constant movement, constant circulation. And these are the trends that we see, um, these harsh ways of managing homelessness are something that we used to see in um, North American cities, in, uh, in, in cities of Europe. And, that, uh, and in that way, it sort of um, also, happened in in, um, in 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 India in Indian cities the lockdown reinforced revanchist trends of sanitizing the city in the pre-pandemic time that happened in the name of city beautification and infrastructure now it happened in the name of disease prevention and control echoing some of the class-centric colonial ideas of hygiene and pollution and despite bans on eviction and displacement around this time all took place through evic and in the sense that evictions took place, People were arrested under various urban uh, management laws, such as begging. Uh, personal possessions were seized. There was an increased police brutality. Uh, destruction, the, there were destructions of people's homes. Um, even during the pandemic, city spaces were being cleared up for beautification. 
The third is uh, the shelter-centric approach to houselessness. So from pre-pandemic times, the provision of homeless shelters in Indian cities has been deplorable. Uh, Delhi has made a few, uh, uh, Delhi has, a, has been a success story, but if you see largely uh, in, in most of the urban centers, the shelter itself, despite being there, there being a Supreme Court order, sh the shelter uh, is quite bad. Um, and by shelter, I mean institutional shelters. Now, this pandemic saw a proliferation of shelters and activities around it. While this is a victory for many activists who have been fighting really hard all these years to ensure provision of shelters to the houseless, it tends to make the policy response towards houselessness shelter-centric. Some of the respondents that we spoke to in the shelters spoke of their adver adverse experiences of being separated from families, <laughs> loss of livelihood and social networks. And again, these responses sort of tell us something about uh, the dominant ideas of urban inhabitation, uh, which is that one's place is either in the house or in institutional shelters. The fourth was a response through food and hygiene uh, or awareness around it. And some of the immediate government responses to the pandemic was to address hunger and hygiene. Most people, uh, most people did not know about these schemes and Maggie will probably tell you a little bit more about this and had to be dependent on civil society actors, NGOs for ac ac accessing uh, you know, these basic necessities. Undoubtedly, the distribution of uh, food grains and cooked food uh, worked really well to provide immediate relief to people who had overnight no means of availing even these basic necessities, but their distribution itself has been very undignified and uneven. The other significant response was through the improvement of personal hygiene. While the WHO uh, and major health organizations recommended frequent hand washing, uh, millions of people in the world we know does not even have access to clean water. So those who were lucky received sanitizers and masks from the state and civil society actors. Uh, there was a constant insistence and even shaming around hand washing and personal, personal hygiene. Now in pre-pandemic times, um, accessing water and sanitation was a huge challenge anyway. Uh, for instance, a uh, family living on the street, uh, and this is a general figure that I'm uh, telling you from uh, the, the Indian cities, um, a, a family living on the street spent almost 20% of their household income in accessing sanitation services for urination and defecation, if they were regularly using PNU's uh, public toilets. With implementation of the lockdown, these became even more hard to access, even more expensive. So the question is, where will people access water to wash hands when they don't even have something as basic as you know, clean water to drink? And the fifth trend that I kind of started with as a provocation was that COVID was not so much a health issue. It was an issue of, uh, you know, uh, it was an issue uh, of lack of food, loss of livelihood. Most houseless people that we were speaking to uh, said that it was not COVID, but the doc lockdown that disrupted their lives. Those, those who live on the streets particularly said that year long, they li living with these ailments, uh, uh, fever, flu, cough, said they can't see you know, and, uh, and this was nothing extraordinary and there was nothing extraordinary happening to them during COVID. The other side of this is that uh, another way to read is that how little attention the state pays towards uh, health issues of the houseless. Initially, access to testing was nil, vaccination uptakes have been very low, and even within the state, very little has been done in building confidence among people about the vaccines. Whereas, you know, there was there was a concerted effort uh, within the state to uh, sort of create awareness about vaccines, but this effort did not sort of go down to uh, these houseless communities. There were rumors around vaccinations and access to medical care, for many, uh, for uh, like many, uh, many respondents uh, told us that they were afraid to go to hospitals because they did not trust doctors and they were convinced that parts of their bodies would be missing. Uh, and it says a lot about people's experience with health and with the state in accessing health. So, and it also says something about the way public policy and uh, public health responses are designed around strong ideas of what constitutes hope. And it, so with this, I will just I, I will uh, sort of ask invite Maggie to give her uh, you know uh, experiences from Mumbai and uh, yeah Maggie, if you could take on from here. Uh, thank you, Paruj. 
So as uh, Paroj mentioned, I will be deep delving into the specific case of the metropolitan city of Mumbai. So um, since our project was uh, in different cities, I, I will be focusing uh, on the case of Mumbai and what we found from the, uh, from the field in Mumbai. So briefly about the methodology, we went about uh, doing primary interviews, in-depth interviews, and focus group discussions with several houseless clusters. I'll be showing you the locations of some of these clusters that we um, met in person. And we analyzed government orders and court judgments. And also we reached out to a lot of different stakeholders uh, from the state, from the civil society, even academics. So that was pretty much the methodology. And these are some of the locations uh, wherein we conducted primary interviews. So um, we have, I mean, cut out a few things. These are some of the themes that emerged from our research, which we thought we would like to share um, today. Um, but I would invite you really to contextualize whatever we are talking, because I am going to be focusing on our analysis of the government governance measures that were taken up by the state while engaging with the houseless during the pandemic. But we should contextualize it as Paroj did in their already um, existing situation in which the houseless community lives, the, uh, the existing crisis in which they live, but also place it uh, within what happened after the pandemic and especially the lockdown, wherein that, the, that crisis got extremely exacerbated with massive loss of livelihood and therefore also loss of traditional you know, relationships and social networks that got them food, water, sanitation, et cetera, like all the basic services. So uh, going into the themes, the first one uh, is that we found that many of the governance measures were really ration centric. Schemes like, we all know that schemes like Pradhan Mantri, Garib Kalyan Yojana were announced and also Atmanirbhar Bharat with the aim that the government doesn't want to allow anybody, especially any urban, uh, any poor family to suffer on the account of non-availability of food grains due to the disruption that will be caused due to the um, lockdown. And this promised a certain amount of you know, food grains and, and pulses. And civil society and academicians were very, very quick to point out the inadequacy of these schemes. And there was a lot of debate during the time in um, early April 2020 about the amount promised, the exclusion of those without ID cards, ration cards especially, and the safety concerns of those who would crowd these spaces uh, in ration shops, etc. Uh, and although the At Atmanirbhar Bharat did later, you know, listen to some of these um, critiques and try to expand it to, to those uh, who don't have ID cards or ration cards, especially after the issue of stranded migrants and moving migrants became so um, hyper-visibilized by the media. But through, like when we spoke to our interview participants, uh, almost none of these participants knew this is where engagement with various NGOs or civil society, there was some bit of knowledge, um, but most of them didn't know about these schemes. And um, in some places they did receive free grains uh, upon asking, but not the amount mentioned. And uh, one major thing is that people without houses or payment dwellers are not in the imagination of these kind of flagship policy um, for the safety of poor. Why we say that is because most do not have access to PDS uh, in any case because loss of because of loss of constant loss of ID cards due to constant evictions by the police and the municipal corporation, and single houseless, especially single men or single women who are living on pavements, they don't have the ability to cook even if they are uh, even if they have um, provisions for rations even if they are provided with rations they cannot cook so next the state government in maharashtra also like uh, you know this was one of the flagship things that they announced they made the shift bhojan um, 
scheme, which is a very uh, flagship scheme of the tripartite Mahavikas Agadi government in Maharashtra, wherein very you know nutritious meal is provided with very subsidized. They reduce the uh, cost of the meals uh, during the time of the lockdown. Again, um, the questions are that, and this, this scheme is relatively new. It was only announced in January 2020, and it's it's a promising scheme. But the questions are that, where are these Shiv Bhojan canteens? How many are operational? How many people avail these services? And is there any ID requirements um, to avail the services? The answer to all these questions remain very vague. And even if we try to you know, find specific answers to this, it's very difficult to access the exact uh, locations for these Shiv Bhojan Thali um, outlets. Again, uh, none of the um, houseless clusters that we spoke to um, were aware of these and it, there are there are like restrictive timings as well for Shiv Bhojan. It's only available from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. So what about the rest of the day? So that's a big question. Again, the BMC also like had a huge food distribution uh, drive for which as this newspaper uh, article says it won an award. Um, so 1.84 crore, uh, 1.8 crore food packages uh, were uh, claimed to be distributed along with 4.5 lakh dry ration kits. And they collaborated with a lot of NGOs and they, they also had an online platform like Milker, etc. Uh, so that repetition is um, avoided. But what we found from the field was that the distribution was fairly uneven and it differed from the city, main city and the suburbs. Wherein in the city it was more regular, but the suburbs got completely um, missed. And the food was mostly repetitive as a result of which most of it was wasted in, in mass in many areas. And it was discontinued after June. Um, and it was patchy. Like we didn't know when it started, when, like, you know, where it started. In some places it was continuing even after the lockdown, but for most places it just stopped abruptly. And it was even more lacklustrous during the uh, second wave. Um, there were allegations of corruption tendering that emerged, which put a stop to it uh, around um, May 2020. As a conclusion to this, I'd say that what we felt from the field was that most of, for food, most of the houseless relied on civil society, private individual, like individual citizen, uh, citizen uh, charity and also self-organizing efforts that they themselves like somehow did some things and just organized and got themselves food. Second, the second larger theme is shelter centric as Paroj had mentioned. So this is the most direct government order that was passed by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, which engages with, with the question of houseless and what the government wants to do for the houseless. So this, this said that free food will be given to the homeless in DAY NULM shelters, and the state would pay for it per person 100 rupees. And um, it also gave directions to, the, to those who manage these shelters, the shelter management agencies, um, uh, for maintenance of sanitation and referral of the sick to the hospitals. But if we come to the case of Bombay and Maharashtra, Besides the fact that the shelter managing agencies, those who manage these shelters had a lot of problems with regards to clearance for construction of you know, shelters, et cetera. They had a lot of um, problems that they faced, which emerged through our interviews. Besides that, the number of ho houseless population in the city that are residing in these shelters is really, really minuscule. It's, um, as compared to the total population is almost nothing. If you look at the right-hand side um, uh, image, this is from the state NULM report during the pandemic. Uh, it says that there were 10 shelters with a capacity for 320 people, whereas the population of houseless uh, communities in Bombay of, uh, in the census of 2011 is 57,416, which is itself 
very controversial and um, people who've been working with the houseless in the city for a long time says that it's a major underestimation. So the numbers are as high as two to three lakhs. So for two to three lakhs, um, 320 people um, is, I mean, that ratio doesn't um, really, is not promising. So another thing that the state government then started doing was building temporary shelters, like Paroj was mentioning, it, it gave out these, um, you know, it came up with this government order saying that schools should be converted to um, temporary shelters for migrants, primarily because again, hypervisibility of migrants, but also for the houseless communities. But then, like she mentioned, local residents took, um, local residents and also bureaucrats and uh, politicians took, um, they opposed this because they claimed to put them at risk because the assumption was that these are uh, disease carrying bodies and you put them just, you know, like, um, make, us, make us more vulnerable to the disease. Um, and also, like, you know, there were concerns about, uh, you know, how it will affect the public property of the schools. So um, there were, uh, you know, some shelters that were again arranged. Again, this is what the BMC came up with, some, you know, temporary shelters that were arranged. But again, this was not easily accessible and signposting was completely missing. Everything was happening through Twitter, which is, of course, not accessible to, you know, almost all uh, houseless population. It was mostly available with people who are working closely, like even for civil society, not everyone could access these, um, these list of temporary shelters. It was only those who like, were closely working with the BMC who had these, um, this list. And this is like a classic case of um, how policy intention got somewhat lost uh, while being implemented and it, the intention was completely um, destroyed in how the way it actually uh, percolated to, this, to, the, to the field. And this is the case of a temporary shelter wherein we, we spoke to the chairperson of the shelter monitoring committee, uh, committee which, is a, which is a body that is installed by uh, the in order of the Supreme, and it is there in every state to look at the construction and maintenance of shelters in the city. So early on in the pandemic, they, the Shelter Monitoring Committee of Maharashtra seem to have come up with a set of protocols for the houseless community. And it was sent to the Urban Development uh, Principal Secretary, who gen then sent it to municipal co uh, commissioners in various cities. And uh, there were a lot of like, you know, it has I have it here and I'm not going to go into the details of what all points it had, but one prominent point was taking care of people who are sleeping on the, seat, uh, on the streets so that they don't stay out. And they said that the in the beginning, at least the nature of the pandemic was not known and there was very limited information. So they, they wanted to avoid crowded places and it was believed that being out in the open would be susceptible to the virus, etc. So they ask the municipal bodies to make arrangements for tem temporary shelters. And the um, Shelter Monitoring Committee also has members from civil society and NGOs who were also in favor of this temporary shelters and moving people to shelters in the beginning because of the uh, uncertain nature of the pandemic. But what really happened, I'm sorry, this is, please pardon me, this is a very long quote, but this is from one of the communities. We heard such stories from many communities. But this is from the Journey Road cluster, which is like a, uh, like a cluster that's right outside the railway station. So uh, for them, what I'll summarize it in two, two three lines. Uh, basically, they were uh, taken from their, um, where they usually are to a faraway building, which was the temporary shelter prepared for them. And there was nothing, no arrangements. And it was couched in the language of safety, of course, like the officials who came to take them wanted, you know, they presented it as a measure for safety, to be safe from the virus. But when they reached that place, um, there were no arrangements for food or sanitation or even uh, like logistics so that they could uh, fend for themselves, make their own food. Nothing was there. As a result of which they felt like they were almost incarcerated. And um, they could stay for a maximum of four to five days and then they just 
and they were in fact locked up they were not allowed to go out of the temporary shelter for anything so uh, like they said at the end they say uh, this person says dhamal kar dala they just completely you know uh, got rid of the locks and they ran away and came back to their settlements and found in many cases like parod said that their usual uh, places the, the place that they called home was getting ready for um, beautification projects etc so that's one of the um, things that happened uh, next is policing the pandemic now um, we know that this was like really brought about by many uh, media reports as well that the lockdown was more than being a measure of public health for the containment of virus it became a uh, policing um, policing measure for anyone seen on the street and for those people who call the street their home their so i mean it was doubly uh, uh, it left them doubly vulnerable because like you see in this quote from mahim houseless cl cluster they had to leave their they were asked to leave their regular uh, settlement and hide behind a barricade um and this hiding has a lot of uh, repercussions for them because they are depending on uh, you know individual citizens giving food or charity and also like civil society um, relief efforts and if they are not seen then it affects their um, life during the lockdown so so many of them couldn't sleep and did, did go hungry in many nights and this is a, again another quote in which this person from bodyguard lane says that you know i mean we were asked to be uh, we were we had to remain cooped up in our little huts or spaces that they made and even if they were to cross the road and uh, go across the street to stretch or like take a breath uh, they were um, kind of showered with blows so these, these there were many such stories that emerged and again there was a moratorium on evictions which is a timely ritual that happens with houseless communities in bombay in mumbai uh uh there was a moratorium on that um by the bombay high court which was put right at the beginning of the uh, lockdown but which continued to late um september 2021 but on the field um i mean these continued to happen uh, especially with informal settlements like slums there were a lot of evictions that happened in the slums which created new houseless population during the pandemic um but yeah in some places um, the, the lockdown this was the only positive that came out of the lockdown for them that they got some respite from the eviction so it was not as frequent uh fighting the virus this is like because let's not forget it was a pandemic um so what about fighting the virus so now this is one uh, information booklet that was released even before the lockdown by the state government and as you see from the images i like we pulled out from the report uh, this is in local language but it is is targeted to a section of population with access to space for social distancing unlimited water supply uh, and uh, for, like for washing hands etc and easy access to healthcare and uh, for most of the houseless like paroj mentioned there was no means of getting gloves or sanitizers or a fresh mask every day and also little knowledge uh, about the virus itself now the ministry of health and family welfare was coming out with these containment plans very regularly beginning in april um and it had detailed set of guidelines for what they intend to do for the pandemic of course much of this was very very centric uh sorry very very generic and catering only to the middle or upper class residential complexes um but then later on in may if you look at the right hand side the ministry of health and family welfare came up with this specific uh, preparedness uh, guidelines for urban settlements uh, specifically targeting informal settlements within the cities and some of the measures mentioned in this document are very very uh, good i would say i mean uh, in terms of spreading awareness and um, getting people access to basic services like food and um, sanitation etc but then again the question is we were like some of the we reached out to some stakeholders who have been working with informal settlements so called slums in the city so this seemed very dharavi specific because dharavi got like again hyper visibilized everyone was concerned about what will happen if dharavi explodes with covid 
so this was very dharavi centric and many of the informal settlements in the edges of the city also got left out so there was no with respect to the houseless there was not even an acknowledgement that this houselessness is also a form of informal settlements in the city so these are some of the again some of the quotes from the community that everyone says wash your hands wash your hands but we don't even have water to go bathe or you know drink so then the question of washing hands out of the picture and some of them didn't even like bathe for several days i mean because because it was so difficult some some places community toilets were closed or inaccessible and there were long lines so it was that difficult and for them to even access water so in washing hands every after every contact is like totally not in their world view at all and uh, of course like parut said if for them to access community toilets it's not free and a substantial amount of their uh, income goes into just daily accessing um, um you know toilets uh, for whatever like and so if if in the case of the pandemic when there is a big question mark on the livelihood so for them it was it was a major major issue right and and many of them went under debt to the toilet operators which they paid through the money that they got from charity or some of the efforts that they were doing themselves and like paroj had already mentioned that they were scared they were not really scared of the virus but they feared their living conditions and their future about basic services um this is a good quote wherein they are saying that we were completely dependent on the generosity of others people's institutions and organizations but they also showing that they they have this awareness that we can't go on forever like this so they they did whatever possible and whatever came their way in in terms of small alternate livelihood strategies in order to survive so now there were a lot of concerns about you know homeless houseless populations being left out of testing and vaccination etc but to be honest from the field it there was so much loss of faith and distrust with the, how the lockdown really happened and what all was happening the, in the context um that many of the people were very very wary of any state um mm. initiative especially vaccination of course there was a lot of anti vaccination Uh, attitude um and also like they felt that you know corona doesn't affect them the houseless population doesn't have corona so many people um yeah claimed uh that way so then um, the like bombay high court did you know you know there was many courts actually were talking about the vaccination for houseless population and then the ministry of housing did come out with a circular saying that you know the people should be vaccinated but again very shelter centric those of the houseless people who are based in institutional shelters which is of course like i said not the case for the majority now judicial activism this is something that our collective did because during the second wave even the little um um food centric measures of governance that were happening in the first uh, wave were really toned down and uh, in addition even the civil society food relief had significantly reduced and people were just emerging from the you know repercussions of the first lockdown so it hit them really hard and to be honest the uh, municipal corporation of greater bombay didn't didn't plan at all for relief they uh, the nature of food relief was really dumbed down and the the number of beneficiaries were also for some weird reason undercounted just 5000 and this is clubbing everyone together like houseless disabled senior citizen sex workers everyone and they were doing some kind of food uh, distribution for 5000 people which is i mean it's unexplainable inexplicable um so so we as a collective like our field work partner and our field, um, research facilitator Uh, Brijesh Arya, who's the founder of an NGO, Pechan, that has been working with the houseless population for a long time. We filed an FI, a P, we filed a PIL with uh, the Bombay High Court, saying against the municipal corporation, and we demanded very, he demanded very like basic services like food, water, and sanitation. And while the initial um, 
initial response of the court was very very encouraging the final court judgment said this like you know and this was heavily covered that the homeless should also work for the country everything cannot be given to them on a platter so this is highly problematic of course we 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 went we went ahead and wrote a whole article about the problematic statement that the court could that the court has made um but um the biggest problem was that it was peddling this idea that again that it has been doing for some time that the urban poor is a free loader and it is kind of encroaching on public spaces and public resources mm -hmm. whereas the reality as mm -hmm. ratula will um, kind of expand on is that most of them are working people and most if not all of them uh, have to work frankly so yeah with this uh, the imperix is over and i would invite ratula um to make some concluding remarks thank you so much thanks maggie if you can just push it to the next slide yeah the overall findings um thank you i think paroj has laid out the broad sort of uh, thematics and the theoretical framework that we had and maggie's kind of gone in depth into what we found in mumbai what i'm going to present is sort of to sort of uh, bring things together um we are sort of looking at uh, the policy and governance dimensions what really stood out for us i think the first uh, thing that sort of comes to our mind is that uh the first point that comes to our mind that we struggled with a lot is uh, you know who is uh, the homeless and why are we sort of uh, terming them as houseless while we were clear of our stance in calling them the houseless we were also very puzzled by the actual figures that we found in terms of enumeration in the census uh, various figures uh, you know that came up from different kinds of reports that activists had prepared none of which was actually matching so activists claim that you know in, and in this was true for cities such as calcutta delhi and mumbai where we did the work activists claim that you know uh, what you were seen seeing as official figures in terms of uh, the numbers of homeless is actually probably one third or one fourth of what uh, exists on the ground uh, and and but there was a, a sort of an idea that not all of this not all the homeless population uh, that is being sort of tagged as homeless by the census is one homogeneous lot the fact is that the nature of houseless population are varied across cities and even within the cities and so this also brings up questions of you know how do we sort of address uh, the issue of you know uh, food shelter livelihoods uh, uh, access to sanitation access to health etc um, and inclusion uh, uh, social protection measures uh what we found is that the group is the groups are very heterogeneous and there are heterogeneous with respect to conditions of living uh with conditions of livelihood and the levels of destitution so just as an example uh what we found in the case of calcutta was that you know we found uh people who had uh you know there were mostly families uh, living on the streets um but we also found uh uh migrant populations single male migrant populations living on the streets as well so intergenerational families as well as single male um single male or single female uh, uh populations uh all or most of whom were working in some kind of precarious labor or the other uh whether it was you know as domestic laborers or rickshaw walas or uh you know simply carrying things from one place to another uh so those kinds of activities in the city which all came to a stop during uh, the pandemic uh in delhi however uh, the predominantly what we came across uh was uh, single male migrants uh, who suddenly found because of the pandemic that uh, you know the kind of shelters that they had been living in those arrangements kind of closed off on them or if they'd been living on the streets uh, they found it uh, untenable because they had uh, lost their source to livelihood and therefore they had to move out sometimes uh, they were with family and they also moved out so i think the delhi case sort of came up uh, as, as you know the exodus was very very clear in delhi 
and again in Mumbai, um, which we saw the exod exodus kind of happening, uh, people moving away from the city back to their uh, towns. In Mumbai, however, uh, we found much more of the intergenerational houseless populations who had been living on the street for close to 40 years. People who, had who were born on the streets of Mumbai, who identified themselves as Mumbaikers, who did not have a home to go back to other than the streets that they had been living on. Uh, and this, you know, this peculiarity across the cities, you know, definitely gave us uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of brought home the point that, you know, whatever we do, we need to be very careful in how we're sort of thinking about uh, the homeless uh, population and, and what kind of strategies, therefore, to sort of um, address them. Uh, the policy implementation varied across the states. Uh, and also, this is because historically of the movements, the presence of activists, and the way in which states had already been responding uh, to uh, homelessness. So in Delhi, whereas you found, uh, you know, uh, a great many sort of uh, uh, shelter homes already sort of built uh, under Dusib uh, or enforced or being enforced through the master plan uh, because of the work of various activists such as Harsh Mandar, etc. Uh, in Mumbai, however, uh, there were very, very few actually built shelters. Uh, they were there on paper, but a lot of them, when we sort of went through them with a the comb, we found out that, you know, they had included uh, homes for, you know, the beggary homes, uh, homes for children, homes for, you know, destitutes within uh, the shelter home list as well. Uh, so this kind of, again, sort of brought home the point, uh, and funds had not been utilized under the shelter, uh, the shelter management committee also said that funds had not been utilized, but also you know, space is, is at a premium in a city like Mumbai. And, uh, you know, to get shelter homes in Mumbai is probably, you know, going to be an uphill battle. Uh, in Kolkata, we did find uh, there were uh, a number of permanent as well as temporary shelters under the KMC as well as the State Urban Development Authority uh, uh, being managed by sometimes private players as well. Uh, but uh, these were, you know, the, the numbers of actual beds that can uh, they could accommodate were very, very low. So the Supreme Court order, uh, which, you know, uh, activists had sort of fought for, and, uh, and they had sort of got this verdict of, you know, one shelter, uh, one shelter housing 100 persons for every one black population. This was in 2014. And this was sort of integrated into the NULM uh, under the scheme of shelter for urban homeless, they were supposed to build permanent shelters, which would be 24 by 7, 365 days a year, safe, secure, sanitary, hygienic, with access to infrastructure. This is 2014, and we are standing at 2022, where you know we are, we are finding that there is a very sort of uneven uh, implementation of policy and various sort of cities, uh, local governments and state governments have kind of worked around this policy in various ways, but it it requires an active sort of uh, activism uh, by groups uh, to sort of uh, push this case uh, for shelter homes. Uh, so shelter was inadequate, many, and what we found that uh, our study said that many were also outside the ambit of shelters, uh, either by default or by choice. By choice, meaning that, uh, you know, if you had families, uh, intergenerational families, et cetera, during COVID, none of them wanted to be put in shelters where they felt incarcerated or whether they would, or in places they would be actually separated by gender. So the males in one place, the females in another place, which actually increased their feelings of insecurity rather than giving them sense of any security. Uh, shelters, also, from what we found out, for the, those who were housed within these shelters, uh, said you know there was top-down forms of management. Uh, the control of shelter homes was you know uh, in the hands of the management committees. Basically, there was no space for uh, the homeless themselves to sort of you know have a dignified existence within these shelter homes. They were treated more like inmates rather than inhabitants or citizens. Right. So, uh, 
So this is with regard to the shelter uh, dimensions that we found out. With re respect to the pandemic governance around food, around sanitation, around hygiene, and access to health, what we found out is that, you know, it seemed as if uh, city governments had no clue as to, you know, who is the homeless, where are they located, how many of them are there, what are the different kinds of groups uh, that you find as uh, homeless, uh, what are their specific requirements, uh, uh, you know, who needs access to packed food, uh, and who would require uh, ration and would be able, you know, to survive with rations. Um, so it was almost like, you know, there was a, a tendency to sort of clump them together as homeless in one uh, umbrella category and therefore, you know, come up with policies uh, of, the, of, of the nature that one size would fit all. Uh, though we do understand that this was a very difficult time and, you know, there were multiple sorts of governance crisis um, that uh, city governments and state governments were faced with um, at the point of the pandemic. Uh, one of the things that we also sort of noticed is that uh, the, the pandemic governance uh, of the homeless kind of was on the lines of containment uh, and not just the homeless, of course, you know, one must contain uh, the spread of the disease. And so temporary shelters was kind of the go-to model, uh, get people off the street was the go-to model. Uh, and this was something that was resisted by the people because once they found themselves in the shelter, they also said, you know, they felt uncomfortable, they felt uh, pegged in, they felt, you know, less about themselves, they felt uh, unfree, and they also felt that, you know, that was more crowded and possibly unsafe and unhygienic and unhealthy to for them. Rather, they would prefer, you know, the openness of the street, the the air to breathe in and be all on the street, back on the street. So whereas, you know, the, the, the strategy, top-down strategy was to contain the spread uh, and move people away from the street into the shelter, uh, people sort of resisted this, uh, a lot many people resisted this and came back to live on the street. Uh, food programs, uh, as Maggie has already pointed out, government actions fell short um, they were inadequate, they were sort of late uh, to recognize the gravity of the situation, the scale of the situation. Uh, in Delhi, a lot of the uh, distribution of packed meals uh, was restricted to shelters uh, when it came to the government um, uh, sort of uh, response. In Mumbai, we couldn't just find Shiv Bhojanlalais. We, we started asking around, we couldn't find them. In Kolkata, interestingly, uh, we found there were kitchens run by the police uh, at, at certain points in, in the city. And uh, though this wasn't a very, uh, you know, a comprehensive phenomena, but there was uh, an attempt uh, to sort of address uh, this question. However, across all three cities, we found NGOs stepping in, especially to help those uh, who were sort of on the streets and not in shelters. And uh, here, you know, there was a variance in terms of the food they received, the way the food was distributed. In the Mumbai case and in the uh, Delhi case, we found uh, people from within the community taking an active part and an interest in, uh, you know, uh, helping the NGOs to distribute the food to ensure that, you know, nobody was left behind. Uh, that, you know, uh, there were ways in which, you know, the, the most destitute of all would uh, have access. So there were sort of ground uh, negotiations and ground kind of conversations happening at that level where people, uh, uh, the houseless people took an active engagement and interest in creating these linkages, even during the pandemic. So that sort of brings us uh, to, you know, questions of what, what do we do? What is the way forward for us? Um, and I think the first place that we should start is by asking again, uh, you know, who are the homeless and what do they need? Uh, this whole question around identification and enumeration. Uh, I think Maggie brought out the fact that, you know, uh, the court sort of dismissed the petition uh, entirely and they said we've been giving 10,000 meals per day. Uh, whereas, you know, the activists pointed out, well, you gave two meals a day. And you gave it to 5,000 people, not 10,000. So you counted it as 10,000 meals, but you actually fed 5,000 people. And which is out of an official figure of 57,000 plus 
houseless people in the city as per the 2011 census, right? Uh, so what happened to the rest? Uh, how do we en enumerate that? I think, uh, and in talking to other academics, what we found out is that, you know, what would be a good place to start is to maybe, you know, come up with some kind of a template um, of what is required with the city, a profile of different kinds of homeless populations, houseless populations, uh, to understand that it is not a homogeneous group, to disaggregate them, to understand it's also a very dynamic uh, population uh, and that there could be new categories that come up. But there is certainly a need for some kind of a baseline and policies, therefore, that are attuned to the different needs of these different groups within what we broadly class, classify as houses. Um, and, and that might sort of help us to sort of understand, um, and also we need to therefore understand the kind of work they do, uh, the, the kind of lives they lead, the kind of places that they live in, uh, how are they able to sort of make uh, a place for them in the city, uh, recognizing them as people who work and not who feed off the state. Uh, and, uh, you know, so in terms of thinking about also long-term social protection me measures, uh, linkages to ration schemes. So there was a point in December 2021 where, you know, there was an attempt to uh, say that, you know, those without ration cards would also have access to food grains. Uh, but, you know, we understand the difficulty of actually uh, sort of putting this on the ground, implementing this on the ground, because a lot of these populations may not have proper addresses, even if they have been living in the city for years and years altogether. Some of them have documents which they shared, but, uh, you know, they said, you know, they, they frequently lost uh, their documents uh, because, you know, they were moving around from one place to another or you know, there were other kinds of calamities, say frequent floods. Uh, in Calcutta and in uh, Mumbai, there were cyclones during the pandemic, which again sort of made their lives uh, extremely precarious during this time. And so you know, they had no place to actually store uh, some of their identity uh, documents as well. Uh, so even if they have documents, they, they frequently lose them is what they came up with. Uh, with respect to shelter, I think um, there has been some uh, sort of localization of the shelterization policy by certain states. Uh, so, for instance, we've heard in Gujarat that there, you know, there have been uh, an attempt to make shelters for families and not uh, shelters that are not gender specific, uh, in order to sort of give uh, uh, shelter to those who are with, uh, coming to the city with family. Uh, there's also a need to very importantly to give a voice or uh, or to sort of give home uh, the houseless populations agency, uh, especially perhaps in the management of uh, shelters. Uh, how do you make shelters friendly? How do you make shelters uh, a, a dignified uh, way to be in rather than somewhere you know they feel, uh, uncomfortable, insecure, unsafe, and, uh, you know, almost like close to being incarcerated. Um, so not, you know, if we sort of move away from a welfareist position uh, and, and sort of I uh, recognize and, uh, and I and sort of uh, uh, really appreciate the fact that these are working people and that these are citizens uh, who have come into the city, uh, how do we sort of go from there um, and, and move into a shelter policy? So perhaps maybe even think about a range of shelter options. Uh, uh, is it possible? Uh, maybe even think about who can afford to stay in the open. Uh, why do we sort of say that, you know, uh, you know, look down upon those who've actually managed to live on the streets um, intergenerationally? Um, and the first picture from our slide actually shows that, you know, uh, but to also ask if they're able to do this, what, under what conditions are they able to do this? What are the vulnerabilities, but what would be the kinds of support required to sort of, you know, uh, enable them or facilitate them in uh, being able to carve out better lives, right? Uh, there's, of course, another sort of viewpoint which also takes into question 
whether we need pay and use shelters, uh, you know, can, you know, is, is that going to be the way forward? But uh, from what we understand, that's uh, probably not uh, something that, uh, you know, uh, that might actually create uh, other kinds of issues uh, on the ground. But certainly it's something worthwhile uh, engaging with, especially for particular groups uh, within the houseless category. Um, also thinking about housing as more in terms of a temporary arrangement, especially for people who move in and out of the city and not uh, who may be houseless when they come to the city, but who have homes back in uh, you know their native places. But there are also categories who uh, are in the city, who live on the streets without a house uh, and have no homes to call uh, their own uh, anywhere in the country, right? Uh, so those would be some of the, the directions that we could sort of possibly move in, uh, but this requires a lot of discussion, debates, et cetera, and possibly, you know, uh, city-wise, uh, localization policies to come forward. Um, and I think when this sort of happens is when you have um, active um, civil society groups as well as empowered uh, homeless uh, citizens who will then kind of come forward and, and discuss this. And in Bombay and in Delhi, we did find, uh, you know, uh, there were groups who were uh, aware of what uh, the NULM spoke of, with what the kind of shelter uh, policy spoke of, who were aware of some of the uh, changes in the policies with respect to food and ration. Uh, but, you know, this is not uh, so evident in the case of Kolkata. Uh, so with respect to uh, ration and food, uh, you know, again, there's a question of how do you actually enumerate, uh, how do you actually recognize um, you know, how, where, what kind of identity are you going to use? Is this going to be address centric? Uh, is, how does this work when uh, these are mobile populations or floating populations, even within the city? Uh, how does this actually work? Uh, with respect to, I think, finally, the point about uh, livelihoods, precarity and dignity, I think what came out very strongly was, uh, you know, the, the kind of absence uh, of thought around in the policy documents around those who were houseless initially. And then once the city, uh, people within the city, the city came to a standstill, people kind of retreated into their homes because, you know, it was largely a stay at home, work at home kind of um, containment kind of strategy to deal with the uh, pandemic. The, the homeless, the houseless became hyper visible. And it is at that point, uh, you know, multiple kinds of, uh, you know, uh, perceptions began to arise where, you know, there was a lot of antipathy towards them as if, you know, they were, uh, you know, dependent solely on the government and they, they were no good, uh, you know, and they were largely destitute. They, you know, the kinds of things that you say that, you know, they are uh, also criminalization of the group. Uh, and also a fear around them that they would essentially, you know, move around the city and spread the disease. So these kinds of perceptions kind of grew and grew because, you know, they were visible out on the street and therefore the need to sort of remove them from the street. But it was also, uh, it was also a, a, a sort of um, a, a kind of blank or a kind of uh, lack of understanding of how these people actually live in the city and how they sort of, uh, you know, uh, carve out livelihoods in the city and how they try. Oh, hi. And, yes. Hi, sorry. You will need to wrap up now. Yes, sorry. yes. This is my last point. And how, you know, this, this question of dignity was sort of premium on their heads, uh, you know, on, on their minds. And this is where they started to, uh, you know, this is where a lot of their discussion with us was about, uh, you know, treat us with dignity, treat us as we are people uh, in the city, uh, not as something that needs to be moved around at your will. So I think this is where we are at here uh, with the study. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you so much. There's so much to talk about in this uh, work. Um, before I, you know, start off, uh, I, I'm just gonna, um, no, there aren't any questions yet. So. Um, 
I guess um, I'll, I'll just ask one of the initial questions. Um, maybe this is a bit of a tangent, but I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about methodology. Uh, how I, I understand that there is so much that you are trying to cover and there is the urgency of the issue itself. And in such a scenario, how do you bring together your um, your approach, your 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 what set of interviews, questions? Like, what, how long did you spend developing them? What, how did you decide on something? Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, Paroj, do you want to take that? Maggie, maybe also. I think yeah, Maggie spoke a little bit about methodology in the beginning. So um, just to, in terms of how we came at the questions, I think it was, I think that's where the collective was really important uh, because one is, uh, uh, this, top, this, this field is of interest to me because uh, my PhD is on this idea of home. And, um, and then, you know, uh, we have we collaborated with activists who were getting, who were sort of telling us every day about uh, what's happening in the field, what are the immediate questions, how uh, people were being impacted, how people were being treated. So I think that that was the initial um, that was the initial uh, place where we started thinking about these issues. Started thinking about we, we started framing these issues in terms of what is it that you know trying to protect people or trying to protect. Uh, you know, the urban residents, what is happening as a result of that to people who are on the street. So, so, that, so I think the first, like, so to answer your question, the first uh, framing was coming from the field, was ground up, uh, being sort of shared with us, with people who were providing relief, who were there in the thick of things, uh, you know, uh, sort of helping people out, supporting people at that time, uh, during the moments of crisis. In terms of methodology, we uh, it was a mix of um, uh, digital and uh, field-based methods. So uh, we had researchers and in three cities. Um, so Maggie, for instance, was the lead researcher from Mumbai, and yeah. we had researchers yeah. in Kolkata and in Delhi. Um, but more importantly, we had again we had people in the field. We had activists who were sharing knowledge with us. Who was actually kind of challenging our sort of academic or uh, knowledge about things. So, um, yeah, I think there's a question. Yeah, so I, I think it was uh, that sense quite a lot of our uh, framing and a lot of our methodology and approach was being uh, sort of framed by what we were encountering in the field. We have, to, and, and having said that, we were also bound by codes of ethics. Mm -hmm. So there were uh, issues of consent, privacy, and even, uh, I mean, a basic thing like, uh, you know, during um, the pandemic, when people are in, in this crisis situation, um, how the, in the questions that we were sort of really tackling with, um, in many situations we failed, but we also tried, we also sort of, there were, uh, you know, good learnings in terms of how are we going to demand people's uh, time uh, for research when there are more important things to uh, you know, take care of or more important things to pay attention to? So I think that's where digital uh, uh, a mix of digital methods became really important and uh, quite interesting also, because we had uh, someone like Rajesh Fire Maggie in the field carrying relief work as well as research work and questions side by side. So there is a lot, right. I think, really interesting question in methodology. And this is something that we are still reflecting on still because this project is not over. We are, uh, we are still continuing. Uh, and while we are reflecting and we have some information and some sense of what we saw, but it's, it's still, uh, yeah, we are still in the process of. Um, I think that is a, that's a very, what you left off on, uh, the fact that you're carrying out research work and you're trying to perform some sort of uh, like a actual duty in that sense. It really does a lot to that. 1960s behavior social sorry the whole action research uh, notion anyway uh we will uh, let others ask questions remy do you want to uh, do you want me to can you unmute yourself okay. yeah, yeah. Go ahead. yeah i can lower mine later on so i don't know what to do so thank you very much uh, maggie paroj and ratula for this uh, very interesting and solid uh, survey 
I can also, I mean, I can only agree with all what have been mentioned because I've been observed more or less the exact same thing in uh, in Delhi. The lockdown has been imposed violently, neglecting the urban poor, sacrificing them. And I agree with that. And but I have a few factual questions about what is happening uh, now uh, and difference between the two two lockdowns regarding the vaccination phase. I uh, I understood that people. Poor people believe that they were not really at risk and they were not afraid of the virus. But did you observe uh, differences between Delhi, um, Delhi, Kolkata and Mumbai regarding the incentives that the government was setting up in order to uh, make them vaccinated? Because we have heard some stories about people not getting ration if they were not vaccinated. And uh, so I would like to know if, what did you observe regarding the vaccination phase. Following that also, I would like to know if you have observed differences do, between first lockdown and second lockdown uh, in terms of uh, social welfare schemes, because I've been very surprised uh, in the sense that the first lockdown has been very violently, it was not prepared and you know, a lot of stuff were not functioning, nobody was getting ration, I mean, nobody, a lot of people were not getting ration. And I've been a uh, <laughs> little bit surprised and the second lockdown uh, was also uh, not very well prepared and the same mistakes were replicating in, uh, in Delhi. So I would like to know if you have observed differences with Mumbai and uh, and Kolkata, and also in terms of preparation of the people, because the only uh, differences that were uh, important, I, I understood between the two lockdowns, was the preparation of the people, the, the inhabitants, the slum dwellers. <laughs> this time, they knew, and they were not acting in the same way than during the first lockdown. And in my, um, so what did you observe in terms of, you know, everyday uh, strategy and last uh, question so i understood that kolkata mumbai delhi is showing more or less the same thing but uh, with one colleague of mine when we were following the two lockdowns uh, so it was a comparison between uh, tamil nadu and uh, delhi i mean uh, one um, sri lanka's refugee camp in tamil nadu in one slum in delhi and uh, more or less it has been shown that um, Tamil Nadu was handling this crisis in a good way because everything was more or less functioning. The PDS system was functioning. Of course, there have been some, you know, sad stories, but more or less the system was resilient. In Delhi, it was not the case. And I had the feeling, but maybe I might be wrong because this was a, a presentation and I've, I've not yet read uh, your paper that will come later on. Did you observe differences uh, in the management of the crisis between these three uh, cities? And are you able to explain it? Why it has been, you know, more or less uh, pathetic in some cases and more or less almost successful in some other cases? Or was it the, really the same problem and the government was not doing better uh, in Delhi than in Kolkata and Mumbai? Yeah, that's my three questions. So one question about the vaccination phase, question about the two different lockdowns, and yeah, and question between these three different cities, if you have observed differences. Um, Paroj, would you like to take vaccination? I can talk about the differences within the cities. And maybe Maggie, you can handle the second, first, second wave difference. Yeah, and I mean, regarding the vaccinations, we are yet to get a full picture of what has happened, what has transpired. But like I was saying in the beginning, um, there was a lot of, um, you know, mistrust among people regarding vaccinations. Just And there was very little done by the state. And this is, we could definitely say in the context of Bombay, in creating awareness about vaccinations, in creating, and whereas this was... Um, actually happening in other circles. The state was, you know, through PSAs, through other sort of public service announcements, they were creating the importance of vaccinations, but it sort of did not percolate when creating this kind of awareness with 
um, these houseless groups. So um, that's what, so, you know, in one of our interviews, it came, and, and, and quite frequently, actually, the, their the entire uh, anxiety around accessing state services for vaccination was, uh, you know, it, it sort of resulted in like some, they, they said that, yeah, we don't want to go to the hospital because our kidney, our kidney nikal lenge. So that is the, and then it says a lot about, you know, what people, how people have experienced uh, public health. So uh, we don't have the exact numbers yet, but this is something that we will definitely, uh, in, we don't have exact numbers in terms of how many people have been vaccinated across Kolkata, Mumbai and Delhi. We don't have that comparative figure, but yeah, something definitely we'll um, share when we have more idea, where we, when we have more information. And to add to what Parod said, it was also like, like the government's in initiatives was again shelter centric, meaning that those who are residing in shelters, how to get them vaccinated. But uh, when we were having discussions across the cities, even from Delhi, what was being like, what was emerging was that there is a lot of doubt and fear with regards to uh, mm. vaccination overall, even mm. within the shelters and people who are receiving institutional. Um, support in that sense and in the case of Bombay I can say for um, like with a significant confidence that um, I mean people were relying on basically whatsapp videos or youtube videos for really information on the pandemic because there was no targeted awareness campaigns or public service announcements like Paro said about the pandemic itself that was targeted towards them so most of the information that they got was from the streets, from each other, from WhatsApp videos, from YouTube videos, which was basically, there was a mix to choose from. So there was a lot of conspiratory kind of material. And for people who have not had a very good relationship with the state, like Parut said, it was, you know, the story was that at least in Bombay, they were like, you know, we will go in, but we don't know if we'll come out of the vaccination center. So we'd rather not go. Yeah, and it also in the way the vaccination was organized for only certain, there, there were vaccination camps. And if you see the speciality of these vaccination camps, they're very much in elite residents, elite neighborhoods, very much in these spaces where uh, it is kind of taken that these people need to be vaccinated. So I think there is also, uh, in terms of, if you look at the governance, and now that we're speaking of it, uh, one reflection that's coming to my mind is exactly about this, like looking at this, you know, speciality of where vaccination centers have been set up, uh, who was targeted, who was actually brought forward. And it was, and we'll see that in, in invariably uh, urban poor groups. And, and I think it says something about the way, uh, whether it's in the state or uh, even within the civil society, in the way you categorize urban poverty, in the way you treat uh, you know, certain groups as uh, certain areas of urban poverty as requiring, as needing attention, while the others continue to be uh, invisibilized. So, and I think, uh, and, and, and in our experiences, these groups living on the streets um, who are also not, uh, you know, vote banks, they are not also, uh, in that sense, they're not that, uh, uh, that significant in number because they are, for instance, they're not dense, they're sort of spread out. I think that also says something about the way um, these groups are governed and managed or not, not governed and managed. Yeah, and therefore, uh, I mean, leading to the second question, therefore, difference between the first and second lockdown. I think in the first lockdown, we all saw all across the country, there was a lot of outpouring of these very organic solidarity groups, especially for migrant workers who were stranded in various places. And it's the same thing with the, um, with the houseless population as well. Like a lot of effort was done by civil society organizations and citizen groups that just came up very organically. But one of the downfall of that was that at least in the second lockdown, and this was very evident because we kind of attended a few planning meetings that the BMC was organizing. I'm talking about Bombay specifically. I mean, we, there was a bit of NGOization of everything. Like NGO, I mean, in the, in the head of the government or the state, 
the responsibility of even food relief was i think to a significant level transferred to um, ngos and there were new ngos that had come up and there were like these um, networks that had formed within ngos and states etc and then so there there was this kind of um, kind of re, uh, relinquishing of responsibility at least in the second i mean there was proactive food relief um at least in the first wave which was watered down actually instead of like you said learning from the first wave it was i mean it was really puzzling a lot of us who who were working on the field here in bombay that instead of learning it was actually significantly watered down and that is why we filed for a you know, we filed the pil um which didn't lead to much so in terms of uh, the different kind of responses that we saw across cities um i think these were colored by center state relations and then state local relations as well to a great degree and also the the sort of array of ngos that you have there um in bombay uh, and in the case of kolkata uh, for kolkata particularly there was an impending re- election uh which was coming up in also in the month uh, you know right in the bang in the heart of the second wave which also possibly prompted some uh measures from uh TMC to sort of open up uh, kitchens uh community kitchens or you know very su- subsidized meals which people on the street could uh access uh also there was i think west bengal was one of the first state governments to sort of come out with a policy that we want to vaccinate the homeless though how did it actually translate to on the ground we don't know but there was this uh you know once the center had pushed the question of uh vaccinations down to the state the state sort of evolved policies but there were also these kind of uh uh sort of pressures or or these kind of considerations that played on uh you know uh who and what uh, would be uh you know addressed within the policy uh, sort of dimension however sort of uh, what did you know what did we get right perhaps uh, one of the things that we did notice uh, during the second wave perhaps was um that there was not uh, an effectively complete lockdown that there was a realization that you know the, uh, life has to move and there you know certain things have to be opened up and so there was limited there was a uh, limited movement there were uh, naka bandis etc but nonetheless uh, the city had not come to a complete standstill so there was some movement and therefore some possibility of you know uh, carrying on with a little bit of livelihood a uh, little bit of work uh, so in from the first wave to the second wave i think that learning sort of happened that you need to allow people to access their their work um, if you can't you know then you know there's going to be a complete collapse in every way uh however you know the the whole sort of move from the first and the second wave across the three cities it was almost as if you know the governments were taken uh by the need to sort of address the health questions first so you hear of you know positive stories from mumbai about how uh, the war room worked or how they were able to uh contain the virus uh you know how the wards and beds were efficiently managed etc uh because of the kind of governance system that was uh, the set up but there was an invisible invisibilization of people uh, living on the streets it didn't really address them but on the other hand we also learned from the the groups that we talked to on the ground uh you know th- this corona is not about us it doesn't affect us we none of us actually felt sick and there were many a times when we kept asking them this question and we were flummoxed uh, to say the least by saying you know there have been other worse things that we face on the street uh, corona can't kill us it's you know it's the rich people's disease it's never sort of attacked us uh, what we really fear is you know livelihood the, we really feel that you know we're not going to be able to live in the city uh, we're not going to be able to uh access the city's resources unless we work so we need to work we need to find work and um we need to sort of know that we are going to be uh, you know we have the money to sort of 
sustain ourselves. So this is something that we found across the city with little bit of variations of cross, across Kolkata, Bombay and uh, Delhi. Uh, Delhi again, I think, uh, as you pointed out, Remy, uh, you know, there, though there is a, a strong sort of shelter approach, there were massive, massive numbers of people who were living outside the shelter. And the NGOs could not cope with the numbers that came, even the shelters uh, from what we hear could not cope with the demand uh, with simple things uh, like food, etc. These were crowded, these were, you know, almost, they became violent because, you know, they were just not getting enough food, uh, even at these shelters. So just, uh, so these were some of the findings that we can share at this point. I'd actually like to, in relation to this, and I would like to answer Kushbu's question. I think she asks a very important, Kushbu asks a very yeah. important question about. Do we uh, want, to, uh, maybe we should just get her to speak first and then we can, um, um, yeah, yeah, sure, then sure, we sure. can answer her question. Kushbu, do you want to just speak a little bit? Yeah, I just wanted to know a little more about the housing rights question, because uh, as one of you also said, that there are a lot of activists who have celebrated uh, this proliferation of shelters. So where does the housing rights stand at all now because of the Supreme Court order, Harshmandar's work on right to food, which actually became part of the Supreme Court uh, activism around shelters. I just don't see anything happening on housing rights. So please enlighten me. Yeah, Thank um, Thanks, Kushbu. I think this is a question we're all grappling with as someone, as people working on not just housing, but urban inhabitation and uh, and 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 uh, sort of access or inclusion within the urban. So I think um, I would actually take a little a sta a stand um, slightly different from yours. We are saying that there are not enough shelters, that we are having to go to the Supreme Court to ask for even the basic shelter infrastructures that are there. But what has happened following the pandemic is that there has been a shelterization of, that does not mean creation of shelters. We don't know if these shelters are going to last or if this, if this was just for the pandemic and you know then it's going to go back to uh, how it was before or uh, they're going to be taken away because these are all temporary shelters. If you look at the spaces in which these shelters were, uh, were being created. Uh, we do, um, I mean, we when we say that we need shelters. I'm also really respectful and sort of really acknowledging the work that people like Harsh Mandar or housing right activists or uh, have done in, in this country to get the Supreme Court to look at uh, the houselessness or the homeless as, an, as a very important or uh, dispossessed urban category. But having said that, uh, housing rights is not just about getting shelters. Housing rights is about acknowledging, and this is not just to do with uh, the activism that has happened around houselessness or homelessness in the country, but also the activism that has ha happened around the way housing in itself has been envisioned. So when we talk about uh, you know rehabilitation, we look we are looking at these uh, we are looking at rehabilitating projects, uh, uh, people uh, far away in uh, these tall housing uh, structures, right? So we need to ask questions even ar around those questions of what is the kind of, uh, you know, space that people want to live in the future? How are we seeing our future cities? And how has ho housing activism sort of, I mean, the way we see it is that there has been one type of housing activism uh, that has been dominant in the cities. Uh, led by certain civil society actors, NGOs, sometimes working in conjunction with the state, uh, and sometimes uh, and in doing that, forwarding the agenda of the state. And this housing activism has, in a way, also created crevices, created further uh, marginalization because it has been very much in a citizenship framework. So if you have documents, or if you're able to uh, acquire documents, if you're able to secure documents, you are you become an eligible housing um, you know, uh, beneficiary. That is something that we need to really question. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, uh, I think that there is a lot to do uh, in sort of uh, framing housing rights or access to housing within the city, within the citizenship framework. Kushbu, thanks for that question. And just taking uh, on from where Paroj left, it's like, 
I think that we have to sort of think of it in terms of uh, you know a range of possible solutions or range of possible pol policies to uh, address this because we while we do need perhaps shelters for the absolute destitute uh you know uh because you know there can be uh women who are absolutely destitute have no one to look after them have no have no sort of means of working also uh so you know starting from there but also or, or you know sometimes old elderly people who are sort of left on their own because their families can't take care of them and they're just left there uh we do find those populations as well on the street but we also find uh you know laboring families or, or families who lived worked on the street lived on the street uh like this photograph uh sort of suggests who are able to sort of you know figure out a way uh, a footing in the city uh though they require certain things from the city such as say you know access to clean toilets access to clean uh, drinking water uh you know just uh, an assurance that they're not going to be evicted especially during uh floods or bad weather uh those kinds of uh assurance that they need from the government but otherwise they're uh, able to sort of live a, a life on their own and and they perhaps aspire for a home uh, a home this is a home for them but they perhaps aspire for a shelter meaning you know in the trends with a roof over the head uh, a permanent roof over the head a permanent address but perhaps they may not as well as aspire for that so what do we do for that group of uh, citizens as well and i think brijesh's work in mumbai particularly sort of brought home this point for us as to how important it is to understand the question of identity and dignity which is not related to an address proof uh, but is related to you know other ways of uh, reckoning who is an individual yes brijesh of uh, pechan in bombay who we worked with uh, collaborated with uh, for the study in bombay um and so we, we sort of realized that you know this this kind of narrowness of the housing rights perhaps uh, definition of pushing it towards a shelter argument alone uh, a shelter home argument alone will not be able to address the multiple different dimensions of needs uh, that are there or the different heterogeneous kinds of populations that we uh, term as houseless okay thank you so much for such uh, insightful answer there are so many things to think about um anybody else feels like they want to ask something from Oh, I just wanted to add. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, Remy can also uh, pitch in, but I think evictions did not stop at all mm -hmm. during the whole period that we were there. There was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and it varied across uh, the way in which it was done in different cities, but it did not stop. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we had also new groups of homeless, houseless. uh being created even during mm -hmm. the pandemic mm -hmm. uh which you know uh we had uh, people who were houseless because of amphan and uh, the cyclone that hit bombay for instance where temporary shelters were broken down and you know there were people who uh you know they 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 just you had houseless populations being created at that point so i think uh you know this this brings home the point that you know uh again uh what are we doing like you know in terms yeah. of you know on one hand there seems to be like a medusa like strategy on one hand we are trying to uh be benevolent and on the other you know we just you know uh, wipe away uh people under the carpet and say you know uh and create you know floral patterns or beautification projects over flyovers that too happened during the mm -hmm. pandemic so yes uh, a bit hydra headed is what i would think is there any way all those uh, some parts of the pandemic or, or the way those evictions happened they have been normalized and they are still um the, they're still part or they have become part of the existing uh like housing policies like permanently now like what would have been an exceptional response to because of lockdown uh and now it's not now it's not going away like it's just part of uh, 
the way daily uh, governance is working is there any such policy you see is like oh it was introduced in the lockdown and it's not it hasn't gone away uh, maggie anything at your end from bombay i think there were these resolutions that were being passed mm -hmm. uh, around spatial containment uh, what is important to keep in mind is that there were already existing laws that were used mm -hmm. for instance city beautification laws or urban planning laws uh, and yeah. regulations which dealt with um, you know removing people or uh, which sort of uh, justified evictions or justified uh, beautification in in the name of, for instance, beautification that also right. continued lockdown. Right, right, right. So, so those were used as instruments, and in doing that, and it and these resolutions, the different resolutions that were passed, right. And if you see this, these different legal instruments, so what have what the supreme the, the 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 decree of the supreme court, they all work together to create this narrative around who should belong to the city and who shouldn't, and I, and these. We can say, I mean, there were no new laws per se which said that no houseless people right. are yeah. no more. But yeah, we are all moving towards that actually. Mm -hmm. Different things that have happened or existing um, laws, new orders, new uh, new ways of insisting that houseless groups or these groups are unproductive in the city. They're all part of the creating the same uh, sort of state perspective, state narrative. However, I do think that. Um the the food and ration kind of perspective uh, holds some promise uh, because it sort of finally recognized that you know you didn't have to have a permanent address uh, in the city uh, to address uh, to uh, or a ration card to you know get rations i think that holds promise but it will be a challenge in sort of implementing on the ground and i'm sure you know work done by Shamindra and others at CPR possibly sort of throw more light on this. We've not been able to follow up, but we do see that, you know, uh, maybe there's some scope of also building up a, a more lasting relationship with NGOs and states uh, in terms of community kitchens. Uh, right. You know, uh, so, you know, sustaining some of that where community, you know, it also acts as some access for employment, local employment, mm -hmm. but also, you know, addresses the question of hunger um, in, in a way. Uh, mm. So there are you know, certain very interesting experiments that happened, uh, certainly. And I think that opens up ways of questioning urban poverty and addressing urban poverty uh, on the ground. But I think you know, there, there needs to be a lot more debate, discussion. It's almost as if you're back to being you know, a pre-pandemic times, as if, you know, uh, forgetting whatever happened it's business as usual in bombay right now mm -hmm. <laughs> every square foot counts uh, so i think that maybe that attitude is not what we realize is is going to work but going forward to understand have more sort of critical dialogues with these important stakeholders is is what is necessary to create perhaps uh, more lasting institutions uh, to help out okay Thank you. Um, any more questions from the panelists? Partha? Um, I think uh, then we should just uh, wrap up. I'll give a couple of minutes of. Yeah, I think so. Do you want to discuss? Do you feel like there's anything you haven't discussed? Because the <laughs> thing is getting recorded. Uh, no, no. So this is. Uh, Paroj, would you like to uh, talk about it? We have a documentary coming out um, okay. sometime in June, uh, which is based on the Mumbai study. Which, oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah, which captures some of these voices uh, who were extremely, I, and I, I think I wasn't there on the field, but uh, Maggie was and Rajesh was and our research assistants were. And we were stunned by the kind of hospitability that we faced on the street. Right. So right, right. I think that uh, really sort of going back to methodology, I mean, they made it so much more easier for us to, mm. to talk. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I think that's sort of kind of related to what Partha is asking. Partha, yes. do you want to just 
unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, oh, my mic is off. off. Uh, Maggie, do you want to respond to that? What is the question? Uh, do we know how the work environment of the homeless changed during the pandemic? Partha is asking the question. The work environment. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> at least in the case of Bombay, I think uh, the work profile differs from the different, um, I mean, there are different work profiles. and But regardless of whatever the work profile, be it construction or like having small businesses, like making flowers and selling gardens on the on the roadside, or uh, like sanitation work, etc. Much of it uh, is dependent on movement in the city and people, and um, and like you know customers being there on the road. So uh, this kind of sudden uh, stoppage of movement in the city, as it is really significantly affected people who uh, heavily depend on that movement, even for, um, you know, not just um, work, but for other things like getting their daily uh, ration because they don't have space to store um, food, etc. So it's like a daily transactional relationship that they have with the city and with the mo movement and the city as it is not existing anymore they all like there was significant um breakage in their you know livelihood profiles and it continued even after the lockdown i would say in some some places because they were considered as stigmatized as carriers possible carriers of the disease right. like there, there is one cluster that was you know that used to go into the golf club and be carried and like carry the equipments and all. But because these were considered to be out on the street and therefore unclean, they were given restricted entry even after lockdown, like after the lockdown lifted. So in many, many of the cases, what they did was like if someone is a, you know, someone is a rack picker, they did something else. They changed their profile completely and started doing small, small things like, you know, sell masks or, you know, sell... Um, little bit itty bitty things. That's how they change their work profiles to survive in the city. So yeah, that's my answer. A lot more selling of masks and sanitizers for sure. Than using, than using it. Yes, yes. Um, and also um, I think domestic workers, women who uh, work as domestic workers uh, still face the stigma uh, in you know they're not being allowed back into many many homes uh, yeah. right now it's changed a little bit but uh, across Kolkata Delhi and Bombay we found that even if the lockdown had lifted most middle class homes were uh, very wary about uh, allowing people living on the street to come back as into their homes as part-time workers so yeah. you know so they lost that livelihood and uh, you know significantly and so this this is something that uh, we found uh, as well. Uh, yeah, Partha, does that answer your question? I know it's qualitative. We don't have numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I think he is okay with it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll have to wrap up now. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, Remy is saying thank you. And uh, yes, all right. Yeah, Great. thank you from our end as well uh, for inviting us and being able to present our research. We would really like the, to look at the documentary. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. you for the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.